please give a warm welcome to Amy, Lauren, and Jessica. All right, well, thank you all for being here. I know the crowd's a little thin, so we're really glad that if you are here that you joined us tonight. Um, we appreciate the introduction, so we don't need to tell you who we are, um, but we can tell you a little bit about how we got here, I suppose. Um, so I'm a coastal ecologist by training, um, and I teach at Georgia Southern University, um, and I'll let the other ladies tell a little bit about themselves before we get started. I am an associate professor at Augusta University, and my background is actually in genetics. So I'm a population geneticist, really a molecular geneticist, but trying my hand at something new. And I'm actually a marine invertebrate ecologist. My background is with blue crabs, and I'm the one that convinced Amy that she should come over to the dark marine sciences. And about six years ago, we didn't know each other. Um, so we all, the three of us were doing, you know, research in Georgia with our universities, and we all met through a professional society that we're all members of. Um, and at that meeting, we learned about a, an issue that was of concern in coastal Georgia, which we're going to tell you about tonight. And from that meeting, we launched um, a project that we've been working on since 2014. I had to think about that for a second. Um, so I just kind of wanted to, to recognize some of the things that are on the screen. So we told you that we're from Georgia Southern and Augusta University. That's who pays our bills. Um, but collectively, we founded the Satilla Science Group. Um, so Satilla Science is the group that we have named to basically tell the story of who we are and what we've been doing uh, down in the Satilla Estuary, which is where we're going to take you on a journey this evening. Um, and we also want to recognize, obviously, Science for Georgia, thank you for sponsoring us tonight for being here. Um, the Dover Bluff Club is actually the name of the local residential community that lives on the shore or that is established on the shore of the Satilla Estuary where we did our research. And we're going to share with you some pictures tonight about people that live there and have spent their whole life there. And they're essentially the reason we're here today because they're the ones that first figured out that there was a problem. Um, and last but not least, we'd like to recognize the Georgia DNR. Um, that was our founder, excuse me, our funding agency for our research. Um, and so we would definitely like to, to thank them. So, well, now that everyone knows everybody, <laughs> we'd like to take you on a little tour uh, to the Satilla Estuary. So um, oftentimes when you listen to scientists or listen to research talks, uh, they might start saying a lot of words, and you don't have no idea what they're talking about, uh, or it may not be of interest to you. So we really want tonight to be about um, communicating science in a way that means something to you, okay? Um, and so you may not have a background in science. You may not care about science, although I think you do because you're here. Um, but ultimately, I think we can all agree that when people start mentioning that there are concerns um, related to the environment, so specifically habitat where organisms live and water quality, that usually gets people's attention. Um, and so at the end of the day, that's, that's what we're here for. That's what we want to talk about tonight. Um, so just to kind of crack some jokes about that, people talk about environmental problems all day, every day. And so um, we don't want to sit here and act like what we're saying is this latest and greatest amazing research that has never happened before. Um, because we're just three gals um, doing what we love and um, essentially this boils down to issues that are happening all over the world. We just happen to be studying it in our neck of the, wo our neck of the woods, which is coastal Georgia, okay? So essentially what we want to do tonight is tell you a little bit about this story so that you leave here uh, caring a little bit more, not just about the Satilla, because maybe you've never been there and maybe you're never going to go, but you probably have a favorite place that you do like to go. So whether it be the coast or a lake or a river, there is some environment that I'm sure you've spent time at um, and protecting that environment and appreciating the water quality is important, okay? So just a little backstory about 
why this topic resonates with all of us. Um, just some fun facts. We live on a planet that's 70% water. Um, and so when people start saying, oh, there's problems with the water, and then the argument could be like, well, so what? We got water everywhere, right? So if we have a planet that's 70% water, it doesn't necessarily seem like that's a big deal. And more specifically, of the water on our planet, the majority of it is salt water. So the majority of it, of course, is attributed to our oceans and our coastlines. What gets interesting is recognizing that that's where most people live, okay? So 40% of the United States population lives along the coastlines. And to make things more complicated, in Georgia, that's within a 100-mile stretch, okay? So um, we're talking about an area that's uh, very dense in population, and it's getting more dense as the days go on. Um, in our particular estuary, if you can look in the graph here of the 100-mile stretch, we're down here in our system at the very border of uh, coastal Georgia to northeast Florida. Okay, and that area is growing, um, and it is of new, exciting uh, prospects, I guess, of some new development. I'll just leave it at that if you've heard anything in the news about what's happening in that area. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over and tell you a little bit more about our story. <laughs> okay, so if you don't remember what the, the coast of Georgia looks like, so we are up here, and if you were to travel, I don't know, approximately 200 miles down, um, I'm not pretty familiar with all the highways that are here, but you get to about Brunswick, and then you go for a little bit further, and then you get to the Satilla River estuary. So the Satilla River has um, a very long and awful history. It is, has been considered one of Georgia's dirty dozen, um, and has a whole host of water quality issues, um, and, um, because of the things that were going on in Brunswick, and it drains the area of behind the Okefenokee Swamp. So it comes through a whole bunch of areas, water quality issues, um, and so that was one of the reasons that this project, when we heard about it, was made it interesting to us. So um, in the late 70s, as um, federal agencies became really important about fishery habitats and fishery species, the ones that we like to eat, the ones that we like to catch, um, there were acts that were put in, put in place in order to protect them. And then in the early 2000s, because of the issues with a lot of our rivers, there were acts that wanted to restore really good fishery habitat. So when we first got started in this project, um, obviously it became, we realized it was more complex than just the one, the three of us standing here. Um, and we ended up learning a lot about the history of the Satilla River itself. So to bring you into this map, so this is the the blow up of the Satilla River. You can't see this back, the small, small mat here. This map was drawn in 1920 based on old land surveys. So you're gonna have to take my word for it that there are two tidal creeks in this system. So there's, <laughs> there's Dover Creek that goes here. If you're looking here, this is Dover Creek here. And then in 1920, there was a second tidal creek, which is Umbrella Creek, which is Umbrella Creek up here. Those were the two main tidal creeks that were in this area. So based on that drawing, we knew that most of the water flowing on tides were coming in those two creeks, coming in on a high tide, coming out on a high tide. Shortly after this map was drawn, there were interests that changed and they decided that they wanted to cut the marsh. Cut is basically a ditch, something that helps um, either navigation issues or it allows for transport of logs. In this case, it was the transport of logs. But in this period of 19, between 1900 and 1932, there were a series of eight cuts that were made in the Satilla River estuary along these two creeks. The most notable, is noise cut, the one that we have been studying over, since 2014. So the interesting thing about noise cut was that in 1910, they dug it out by hand and created this small channel in order to transport logs. This area all up in here in the early 1900s was all pine upland. So this was the easiest way to float logs on the river to the main channel to a, a, pine, a pulp mill that's on the south side of the Satilla River. In 1932, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers decided that they wanted to come in and make it a part of the alternate intercoastal waterway. So they came in with machines, made it wider, dug it deeper, 
and then they realized that 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 noise cut really wasn't a good place for this alternate intercoastal waterway and then dug the alternate intercoastal waterway cut in 1939. The first reports of shoaling, which is sedimentation or the creation of sandbars in those creeks came in from the Dover Bluff community in 1938. Okay, and they have been uh, making complaints about these issues since then. So based on this 1918 map and what we know about noise cut, we think noise cut is probably the main, main driver in the changes in this system. So if you are following this blue line, so you can imagine that this is the main flow out those two tidal creeks in early 1900 before any of these cuts were dug or any of these changes were made. After noise cut, and I can go back, so you can see 1900 and then 19, to, or today, yeah, 19 today, we think most of the flow is now being diverted up noise cut. Noise cut acts like a straw and basically draws all of the water out of Dover and Umbrella Creek. So the local community, which is here, right, we're here, right here, they have actually noticed at this area here, bi-directional flow after um, a high tide, meaning that instead of flow going out Umbrella Creek, on a falling tide. Instead, it goes out one way and then back out noise cut. So based on that, we know that there are some issues that are going on. So the core, there's been several studies done. The first uh, report that was made was done in 1980s by George McMahon, who was an engineer out of the Savannah District Office. And then they came back and uh, confirmed McMahon studies when we started our project there. So what did we decide to do? Knowing this problem, uh, our $8 million question, how do historic unnatural cuts through the marsh affect commercially and recreationally valued species and their habitats? So we're taking a holistic approach. So to kind of show you what's going on here, this is Dover Umbrella Creek in 1960, and these are two of our um, wonderful collaborators that live in the Dover area back in 1960 water skiing, you can see the opening of that creek and the cut. Here is in 2012. So you see that that cut has enlarged, it's gotten incredibly deep, and it is affecting the flow as was said. So how are we going to study this? We're taking a holistic approach. We're going to look top down, we're going to look bottom up, which means we're going to look at the predators in the area, we're going to look at the bottom feeders, we're going to look at the water quality, we're going to look at the salinity rates, we're going to look at the marsh, we're going to look at the bacteria, we're looking at whatever we can to see what's happening at that ecosystem compared to the surrounding area. Okay, so just to give you a little backstory on what is normal in an estuary. So as Amy mentioned, our goal throughout all of this has been to take a holistic approach. So we want to give you the whole story, meaning what is typically going on in an estuary like this. So we're going to just kind of start off and get you oriented. So obviously blue represents water, brown represents dirt <laughs> or land, okay? So here we are, if we're going to create an estuary, um, an estuary, just by definition, is essentially where rivers meet the sea. So this is where you have the mixing together of fresh water flowing off from the land and meeting the tides coming in from the ocean. So what that might look like is here's our river water flowing down towards the sea, but simultaneously we have tidal waters coming in, okay? So as you can imagine, an estuary is just the mixing of fresh and salt water, which is a very normal dynamic system. So we have organisms that live there that have to be able to survive in both freshwater conditions and saltwater conditions, and that changes all throughout the day and through the seasons, okay? And then of course we can't forget about the impact of rain. So in addition to water running off the land and flowing down the river, we also get freshwater inputs from the atmosphere. And through all of those sources of inputs, we start seeing mixing. So this, of course, is where you get all these different chemistries, all these different water properties coming together. 
And as a result, we usually start seeing water changing in its properties. So you can see the water's changing color. So some days it might be really clear and you can see the bottom. Other days with this mixing, it's very um, turbid, which is just a word that means there's a lot of sediment in the water. And as a result, it basically affects the amount of light coming into the water. The reason that matters is because in a system like this, we have to have food. And we have to have food available for all the critters that live at all the different trophic levels, kind of like we're you know, omnivores, we eat animals, we eat plants, and you gotta think about all the different foods, okay? So at the bottom of the food chain, so to speak, my part of the story is the plankton. So my training is in plankton and what makes them do their thing, basically. So phytoplankton are just plankton that act like plants. So they produce food at the bottom of the food web and then there's other plankton that are more like animals and eat them. And then along come other critters. So here is our um, organisms that live on the bottom. These are our benthic feeders. These would be oysters, which we know are very desirable, not only for the estuary, but for us as well. <laughs> and then we have other benthic feeders, such as the blue crab, which we're gonna be talking about in a little bit. And then of course, we have organisms that live in the water column. So here we have some shrimp, we have some stripe, stripers, <laughs> I was about to say something else and I had to get myself oriented. <laughs> some stripers, which is another um, fishery of interest in this area. And then we of course get sharks and other top predators. And then when we look at the land component, we can't forget about the importance of our marsh grasses. So Spartina um, is the most common marsh grass there and we're gonna be talking about them in a little bit. And then we even have critters of interest that live in the soil. So a very dynamic um, microbial community. So when Amy said that we took a holistic approach, she wasn't lying because our study looks at every single piece that we just mentioned. Um, and so that means that we're bringing together a lot of different people with a lot of different um, expertise and we're really trying to figure out what is going on in the entire system. Okay. So how did we do this? Took a small army and I am not exaggerating here. So every month for several years, ex with the only exception being a few months where there was a hurricane involved, we take a couple van loads of students down about four hours to the Satilla from the Augusta area and Statesboro. Once we got there at high tide, we'd separate, we meet at the Dover Bluff community and usually with the gracious help of the Dover uh, Bluff community homeowners would get fed and be spoiled rotten as we got our gear together and got on a series of five different boats. Four boats loaded with gear and students would go to our four main experimental sites. Our control site was on the other side of the Zatilla River, on the southern side, Todd's Creek, which was our reference. Then we had one at Noise Cut, right next to the Dover Bluff community, Piney Bluff, or what we call the node, where we definitely saw a lot of changes in the flow of the water. And then one more towards the mouth in Umbrella Creek, Parsons Creek. Then there was a fifth boat, that would travel around to all the sites collecting water and soil samples at every site. We added a few extra sites to add some data to the water and, and um, uh, the mud sites and mud data. The other sites, we would do a gill net where we would uh, let the net sit for two hours, catching all types of fish. We'd pick up crab pots that were there for 12 hours. We'd uh, do other types of catch and release with, taut, with throwing nets and um, different, then we'd also go into the marsh grass, measure the height of the marsh grass and the density of the marsh grass at these different sites, and then all come back together and pack up and drive the four hours home. So every week, every month, be a marathon day collecting data from all aspects of this estuary. 
and it was a, moment, a, a momentous effort of many, many different people. It's truly collaborative because all the boats were from the community of Dover Bluff. We didn't rent those boats. They were their personal fishing vessels that they let us use. They captained them and they let a bunch of college kids ride with them every, week, every month. So we had five boats, minimum of five people, maximum of five people on each boat. Most of the time it was three, but it could be up to five people per boat for 12 months, for 10 hours, for about five years. That's about 15,000 sampling hours. So we have collected data for five years monthly, with a few exceptions, and collected a lot of data on what's happening in this area. I wasn't kidding when I said it took a small army to get this. And the kids were amazing and dedicated. They'd get up at 3 a.m., depending on the tide, for us to get on the vans. Of course, they'd fall asleep Why we'd be the ones having to drive, but um, or Jess having to drive uh, down to the Satilla, but they always, we never were hurting for volunteers. We always had great participation, and this really was a community effort with the Dover Bluff community, with the students both at uh, in Statesboro and in Augusta, and many different faculty members. We have, what, six or seven different PIs on our grants. Um, so it really is a collaborative effort with everybody's expertise. So, so if we were gonna add scientific words to everything that Amy and Lauren have just described, this is the word cloud that we would kind of get. So um, some of the things that Lauren has tapped uh, touched on is temperature, uh, Amy's um, DNA, and then we, we talked about tuber turbidity, we were talking about trawls. So of everything that we studied, it was obviously that it couldn't take just me, it couldn't take Lauren, it couldn't just take Amy, it was everybody involved. So as Amy mentioned, there was over 10 of us at the two universities that were involved in this project. We even had a physicist that was involved. We did some water flow. Um, with some physics students that created Arduino units in order to measure flow using satellites, um, and um, a, a truly a holistic um, study. So these are some of our field methods here. Um, I do have to shout out to Shannon, who's here in the front. She has been a student, and now she is a, an employee at Augusta University, but has been involved in all aspects of this project. She's here sitting in the front. <laughs> um, here is our, I think that's Dr. Bennett, Stacy Bennett, who's our plant ecologist. And here's Lauren. Um, Lauren, again, doing some more of our water quality data, then pulling, our, a couple of our students pulling in a trawl. Um, so again, a lot of gear, a lot of students. And then, so we, we're out here, we have all the sampling hours, so this is the meat of our, our, pro, our talk, so what do we find? So if you were to take all of the pictures my students sent me about the fish data, you would think the only fish that we caught on the Satilla River were shark and gar. So we really got some, some really big gars. That one was um, almost three feet. Um, we got all different types of shark, um, but I am here to tell you that even though we talked about the Satilla River being a part, number eight in the Dirty Dozen in terms of Georgia's um, uh, Dirty Dozen worst rivers, we really have some interesting fish data. So over the five years, we caught 86 different species, and I know you guys can't read all of the, spe all the species that are on this bar graph, but there are 86 different species that are listed here. And when we compare the 86 species, or at least that number of species that we catch in the Satilla River, it's on par for a lot of the estuaries along the Atlantic seaboard, which is good news for the Satilla River. So while they may have some water quality issues, the fish are telling you that that's not the case. They are still coming up despite the water, fl the water flow issues. Um, and the individuals here that are starred, among of all of those collection sites, those four collection sites, we caught 13 that we found at all four sites, usually all year round, okay? Okay. So what about the blue crabs? We talked about them. Uh, they, and we spent 
specifically with sapodis, which is one of the species of blue crabs, and it is the second largest fishery in Georgia. So it's not just ecologically important for the state of Georgia, it's definitely economically important with a $2.5 billion industry. I know uh, most of the blue crabs they catch, they ship over to uh, China and uh, the Far East because they love to eat our blue crabs. It, but there has been a severe decline in the commercial fishery of this over the past 20 years. So what my approach from a geneticist was looking at the genetic diversity of the blue crabs. Oops. So we had two locations. So we were looking at what we caught at the Satilla River and then what we caught about 100 miles up shore at North Georgia coast at the, at the um, intersection of Georgia and South Carolina. We collected crabs from both those uh, locations, took a, a leg, we also took some of the crabs depending on the size, and what we were doing were sequencing a gene within their mitochondria. So the mitochondria is an organelle within the cell that is important for energy production, and it has its own genome, and we wanted to sequence one of those genes, because there's a maternal inheritance pattern associated with that. And it's also where you can get a lot of genetic diversity from one crab family to another. So when we studied this diversity and we looked at the median number of genetic differences per crab that we caught at the two locations, we saw a stark difference. In the North Georgia coast, there was a, somewhere between 18 and 20 mutations per crab difference in this mitochondrial gene. When we looked at the Satilla, there was less than three. The, number, the median number was two. So what that suggested is the genetic diversity of the crabs in the Satilla was much smaller than the genetic diversity in the North Georgia system. Why this is bad is less genetic diversity, the less chance of survival if there is some major event, they're all related to each other. They're not as evolutionarily strong per se that something could wipe them all out. Plus it also suggests that they're not doing their normal swimming patterns. They're not mixing with other crab species. They're one family that's staying in that area. They have enough food, they're happy. They're not swimming out to the open ocean and doing their normal swimming patterns. So there is something happening with the crab population in this area. Okay, so we've talked about the critters that you see and know about and probably care about the most. I'm the person that most people don't care about because <laughs> I study the little critters that you don't see. They're there and they're important, but you usually don't even realize that they're there. So I'm the plankton girl. And what that means is my interest is looking at what's going on at the bottom of the food web, as I mentioned earlier, because if we can know what's going on at the bottom of the food web, then we usually can make some predictions about what's happening with everybody else. Because if we don't have food, then obviously everyone else that needs that food is not gonna be able to survive. So this data is a little crazy, so I'll go ahead and apologize for that, but let me kinda talk you through it. So what this does is actually shows you how the availability of plankton, which we'll just say is the availability of food, um, is changing over time. So we have it by years, and of course we have it by our sampling months. Uh, but it also shows you what's happening over space because each of the different colors represents a different location in the estuary. So as was brought up before, remember that Todd, that site is our reference site. It's on the south side of the estuary. And the reason it's a reference site, meaning it's our baseline, is because that has nothing to do with any artificial cuts. So if that wasn't clear before, Todd Creek is our reference site because it is the most natural of all the sites that we looked at. All the other sites have some connection to these artificial cuts that were put there in the early 1900s. So what do we know? <laughs> we know that plankton change normally. So 
um, every single day, every single month, every single year, every single decade, plankton go up and down, okay? And that's because they're supposed to do that. They're very sensitive to uh, how much fresh water is there, how much salt water is there, how much sunlight is there, how much sediment is in the water. So it is very normal to see this kind of roller coaster pattern, okay? Um, but just to kind of give you some framework, if I were to take an average over every single data point that I collected, on average, there's about eight micrograms per liter of plankton available at any moment. So <laughs> a microgram is a very small amount per liter. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but obviously you have to scale this up to think about an estuary has millions and billions of liters of water in it, okay? Um, so hopefully that helps. And that number, even though it seems small in comparison to these crazy peaks we get, like the highest amount we ever got was 71, that just is evidence that there was a phytoplankton bloom happening at that point, which you've probably heard about those on the news before. Um, but a number of eight is not abnormal because again, you're averaging over all the ups and downs. So what was actually more interesting is looking at those averages by site. Um, and so as before, if you remember that Todd Creek is our baseline, what that means is even though we don't know what the water was like in the early 1900s, because nobody alive back then was doing this, we can actually think of that as what it probably was like. Because it, again, is the natural site, no connection to those artificial cuts. Ooh, we got some like psychedelic things happening with our slides. <laughs> and then we've got the four other sites that are connected to those cuts. And what's interesting is they all look about the same. And in fact, when I actually run this through a, st a statistics program, it turns out that there was no difference across the sites. And you're like, oh, well, that doesn't sound bad. <laughs> and we're not here to really to say what's good or bad or indifferent, because we're scientists and we want to be objective and we're just telling you the facts. But I can tell you that that's not normal. So in an, a, an estuary like that, that's that large with all these different locations, you would expect differences. Because some areas would normally be more fresh, some would normally be more salty. Um, and that's not really what this is showing. This is showing that the plankton are pretty much doing the same thing all across the estuary, and that's not really what we would expect. The other piece of this is, <laughs> is it me? <laughs> okay, is <laughs> the variability um, of what's happening uh, more specifically, because I, I mean, I'm showing you the averages at the top, but again, you can see that there's still a lot going on within that average. Um, and so what we're getting here is that when we do have variability, which is what we would expect, that's really only happening at the mouth of the estuary, which means the site that is totally removed from all of these artificial cuts, that's where we're seeing things behaving quote unquote normally. Okay, so let's turn them back over and hear about the plants. So obviously I'm not the plant biologist, but I'm representing our plant ecologist who could not be here today. So one of the interesting things that the landowners always um, talked about was this really tall salt marsh grass. So as Lauren mentioned in the beginning, the major uh, salt marsh grass is Spartina, which is pictured here and here. So here is our reference site in Todd Creek. So this is what we expect normal Spartina to look like. It tends to be tall on the edge of the creek, and then as you move away from the creek, it gets shorter, and then you start to see there are some patches here of another species of salt marsh grass as the elevation changes and as you move away from the salt water. That's normal. So in our two, in, our, in the cut itself, and if you remember from our map, Piney Bluff Node is the area where the local community observed the bi-directional flow. Um, and this is one of the areas that we see really, really tall Spartina. So Brittany is five foot five. Okay, so we have Spartina that is almost six feet tall and that is abnormally tall in that area. So our tallest Spartina and the only plant that we find in Piney Bluff Node and Noise Cut is Spartina. That's as far as the eyes can see. In Todd Creek, we see Spartina, some other species, and then Parsons Creek, which is the farthest away that's closest to the mouth, we see the most diversity. So what we think is happening in terms of the water in these areas, that it's very similar water quality parameters, so very similar, almost similar salinity. 
the sediment is very similar. There are some differences, and that, but what's happening is that there are different accumulation levels of that sediment that's promoting this really tall growth of the Spartina in Piney Bluff node, as well as noise cut. Okay. Okay, so now we kind of want to put the story together for you because we shared with you multiple pieces of our data. And if you try to look at them individually, you get kind of one version of the story, but our job is to try to put all those pieces together. Um, so what we want to do here is try to help you understand with our flashing lights um, how all this might come together and make sense. Um, so let's start with the black arrows that are pointing upwards. Do I have a... There we go. Okay, so the black arrows um, essentially are explaining what's happening with the water itself. So for example, what's the temperature of the water? What's the salinity of the water? How much light is going through the water? Because anytime you wanna know what's happening with a living thing, you wanna typically try to explain that with what's going on with its physical and chemical surroundings, right? And so for example, you would expect if the temperature is warm and there's an increase in light, then yeah, the plankton are gonna be happy. They're gonna make some food. And when we've got plankton, then we have more um, other types of plankton, the zooplankton. When we have more zooplankton, we have more crabs. When we have more crabs, we have more fish and so on. So my point is there are definitely some physical and chemical properties of the water that promote all of that biomass and diversity that we described tonight. But then there's some things that obviously can, can cause the opposite effect. So for example, if the sediment, which we've mentioned several times tonight, gets too built up in certain areas, that blocks the light from coming in. Um, and that relates to the color of the water. And as a result, you would expect your amount of food supply to go down. And then of course, that's gonna affect everybody else. So our job is to try to put the story together to see how all these individual pieces of data tell the story, okay? Whoops, wrong button. Okay, so we wanna take you back to our original question and now try to help with an answer. <laughs> I mean. Okay. So when we first, so when we first started, we told you guys about the Dover Bluff community. And after the core came in in 1935 and dug noise cut out by machines, made it deeper, made this great um, alternate intercoastal waterway, then decided to just leave it be. The Dover Bluff community, again, was the first community that came in and started petitioning local governments. They wrote um, letters to the Savannah District Office of the, uh, the, Car the Army Corps of Engineers, telling somebody to come, come out um, and look at what was happening at Noise Cut in Umbrella Dover Creeks. So that was Fred Voigt Sr. Fred Voigt Jr. is this guy right here. His brother is Harold Voigt. They are still uh, Dover Bluff community members. And after um, Fred Sr. passed away, his sons took up the complaining about what was going on outside their tidal creeks. So it was their complaints that brought George McMahon down in the 1980s to first write their, um, um, their report about the issues with noise cut. And then um, how Lauren and the rest of us got involved was the, the scientific meeting that Lauren described at the beginning. We heard a presentation from our colleague, Dr. Clay Montague, who is an emeritus professor at University of Florida, who came and basically presented where is he? Oh, he's right here. Clay, right here. <laughs> um, and presented on this issue. And he basically ended the meeting saying that if there were assistant professors or you know, research scientists who were residents of Georgia, because I am currently, or he goes, because I'm, I'm currently a resident of Florida, there's tons of money involved in here, or tons of research projects that you could use. So w we, here we are, <laughs> several years later. Um, so since... Since we started the project, um, there has been, the Corps has revisited the area. They have modeled the water flow, um, and they have decided for themselves that noise cut is the issue, is the, one of the major drivers here. Um, and I think this, this report came out in 2017, right, 2017. 
after the, the core was here, they came up with this feasibility study to actually close noise cut. So out of their modeling, and then we met with them several times, shared some of our biological data, um, they came up with eight suggested plans on how to fix the water quality issues that the Dover Bluff community was having. And they actually chose the most expensive plan, which is really unheard of. <laughs> and so not only are they closing noise cut, they're gonna close two smaller cuts um, to hopefully prevent these issues. And what they needed to get started was $8 million. <laughs> Is that going to play or is it okay so when you have a um when we showed you guys those early maps that the main flow coming out through tide the two creeks that's an that's what what todd creek is like and that's why we use todd creek as a reference normally on most of those tidal creeks it's tide comes in on a high tide and then all of the water leaves on those on those same channels by adding those cuts you have basically diverted that water flow and now you're moving it around in other places that it shouldn't be. So that Piney Bluff node area, they've seen tons of sediment accumulate. So that water, the water skiing picture is actually just upstream from um, where they're getting a lot of that sediment accumulation. So when we, when we talk about in the terms of the, of the things that we like to eat, so if you are a blue crab trying to get up a tidal creek and you think that you're following flow up and then all of a sudden it changes and you get washed out of the system instead of being there, it's more than just being a bad day for a blue crab that can't find its swimming, its area to grow up in. So that has potential issues for uh, blue crab fishery in Georgia. And then it also has issues for the white shrimp fish fishery, which is the largest crustacean fishery in Georgia. So, so... Yeah, so what they're hoping to do is that that, that straw action that um, is being created by noise cut is supposed to stop. And then that we'll, we're going to talk about that in the next the few slides. But yeah, essentially, that's what is supposed to happen. Is that right? Okay. Oh, is that what? Yeah. So if we go back to that $8 million question, what's happening? So what did we see pre-restoration? More fish fish diversity than was expected, so that was good. But the one thing we didn't mention is the smaller fish. The smaller fish seemed to be accumulating at only one site. We didn't see it on all our sites. So what we, what, so we were surprised that neighboring sites to the cut had lower diversity and more of the smaller fish. They weren't, they weren't traveling as far as the, the bigger fish. Less crab genetic diversity than expected. The tall marsh grass at the sites near the cut and plankton and salinity were more evenly distributed than we expected. There isn't that normal difference at the different sites. So we have a very unique situation right here. If they finish this project, when they finish this project, hopefully changing the flow, getting rid of that straw activity of noise cut. If we go back and do our same tests again, what do we expect to see? So what do we see post-restoration? Same or more fish diversity, a better distribution of the smaller fish across all our sites, increase in the genetic diversity of the crab population, a reduction in the grass heights near the what used to be the cut and make, make sure that grass height is similar in the diversity of the types of salt grasses at all the places. And then finally, that normal gradient of plankton and salinity at the different sites. And we have the ability to do this once the cut gets closed. So with that, we would like to take any questions. If you want to learn more about the Satilla, I'm going to plug the Science for Georgia scavenger hunt because we are a space on that scavenger hunt. So definitely do the scavenger hunt and look for the Satilla River on there. And we would be happy to take any of your questions if you like our t-shirts. We have a whole bunch of them up here. They're, the turtle has our different sites on it. So it's actually a picture of the estuary. So...
All right, thank you so much. Uh, can everybody give Jessica, Lauren, and Amy a hand? Thank you.